All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the Gerontological Society of America's inaugural webinar series on climate change and aging. This is an interdisciplinary international webinar series that was organized by one of GSA's newest special interest group on climate change and aging. I am uh, Dr. Angie Perone and will be moderating this event. Um, so first, let me just remind everyone to, if you're not speaking, to please put yourself on mute. Um, we have the capability to do so, but we would love it if you could do it yourself, um, if possible. And then I also want to make sure that we give our proper thanks to a number of, um, of folks that deserve to be thanked. Uh, first, we want to thank the Gerontological Society of America, um, Gina Schoen, for helping us host this webinar series. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Leah Aylon, Dr. Ann Mitchell, Dr. Patricia Hain for their work through GSA's Special Interest Group on Climate Change and Aging and helping organize this event. And of course, I want to thank our very distinguished speakers for agreeing to speak for our very first webinar for this series. So just to give you, uh, I want to give a quick overview of how we're going to do this. Um, we'll have both of them will be speaking and then we're going to do questions at the end. So if you have a question, please put it into the chat and I will do my best as moderator to group questions that seem similar and then ask them at the end. Um, so uh, welcome your thoughts and insights. So now I'd like to introduce our two fantastic speakers. First, we have Dr. Ruth McDermott Levy, uh, Levy, sorry, who's a professor of nursing at Villanova University. Uh, co-director of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and, and the Environment, has written, taught, and spoken on issues of environmental health and climate change for over 15 years, um, including most recently advancing gerontological nursing science and climate change, climate change and mortality, global health and climate change, and I'm sure many, many more topics related to this issue. Her talk will focus on environmental health issues for older people. And then we'll turn to our se second speaker, Dr. Carl Pillemer, um, who is the Hazel E. Reed Professor in the Department of Psychology, uh, Professor of Gerontology and Medicine at Cornell Medicine, um, a Senior uh, Associate Dean for Research and Outreach in the College of Human Ecology, and has produced a number of articles um, on climate change and aging um, and helped create and serves as the Director of the Aging and Climate Change Clearinghouse which aims to be a central and trusted resource on the intersection of climate change and aging. And just recently launched um, its website, which I highly recommend um, everyone here to check out. It's got a lot of amazing resources for researchers, for older adults, for organizations. Um, so we can probably put some resources about that in the chat at some point. So let, oh, and his talk is focused on engaging older people in climate action. So let me now turn to uh, Dr. McDermott Levy. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Angie. Let me just pull up my slide. Okay, so everyone should be able to see the slides. I can't see you, so I hope you can see the slide. Can Angie, can you tell me, can you see yes. this? Yes. Okay. They look great. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Um, thank you very much. I'm I'm delighted to be here, um, as I was saying earlier, but I'm sad that I'm here um, because we've got problems and we're going to talk about those. Um, I have 20 minutes. And so uh, it, it, uh, this is what I'm talking about really should be a whole course. So I'm going to really focus on what are the physiological changes of aging and, and how is that related to climate health for the older adult? Um, so let's see if this slide will advance. Okay, there. I'm not going to read this slide. I'm going to show you this slide that um, it has more of the pictures of what is climate change and, and why, why is this happening. And so on the left, you'll see kind of the normal um, aspect of our atmosphere. And most of you in gerontology don't typically think about our atmosphere, but in this case, we need to. Um, the the what greenhouse gases do is they add an extra thickening of the atmosphere and hold in the solar radiation that we want some of that to keep earth warm we don't want too much of it and that's what we have now since the industrial age which was around 1850 uh yeah. we can see uh that the 
um, greenhouse gases have expanded or, or increased in the atmosphere. The one you probably heard most about is carbon dioxide, but there's also methane, nitrous oxide, um, ozone, and halocarbon. So all of those cause problems. Um, carbon dioxide is the largest one, but methane actually is the most potent and um, has a shorter half-life. So we can go after that. We can also make an influence. This map shows us, and it was uh, published in uh, 2018 um, in the um, uh, US Global Change Report. It's an annual report that comes out, um, and excuse me, it's, it comes out every four years mandated by Congress. No matter who is in office, they have to do this. It's been coming out more frequently because the science is moving so much more quickly and so is climate change. And so you can see that there's kind of regional influences for um, uh, the things that impact health, such as uh, vector-borne diseases. We see those with a little insect. Um, we see those in the Northeast. Um, and, and we see more wildfires, you can see, to the West. Um, right now, in the, the east part, eastern part of the United States, wildfires are not an issue yet. Uh, I know New England is planning for them um, and addressing them, um, being prepared. So um, again, things are advancing. And, and as I said, this was a five-year-old map, and I would suspect they'd change some of that um, you know, if they were to make the map today. Recently, um, I'm Villanova's uh, in uh, a suburb of Philadelphia. And so um, I'm just gonna share with you the recent news and the sobering news. Those of us in the mid-Atlantic region and also in New England um, have experienced um, rather mild impacts of climate change compared to the rest of the United States. Um, certainly we had Superstorm Sandy in 2011, I believe it was, but Overall, things have been okay until recently. Um, we now, you know, the with the wildfires in Canada, which of course we are concerned about the people in Canada and, and the displacement and loss of home, but but we're seeing the, the impacts of poor air quality in the United States. And this was the first time that the Philadelphia area um, had these problems. And um, for the most part, people didn't know what to do about it. We didn't know how to manage that. And so that's something that we need to be prepared for, for people to take care of and address the needs of older people, addressing that. Um, and I'm gonna get into some of their health issues. We also have had record um, breaking heat. Um, the uh, average for May, global average uh, for the world was um, a, a, little, a little under uh, 63 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and, and that sounds lovely for those of us uh, who are in the Northern hemisphere right now, because it's rather hot. But the Southern Hemisphere is experiencing winter and they need the cold. We need that for our ecosystems to function well. And so, um, you know, things are, are um, really becoming evident of the problems. Um, in, in New Hampshire, as well as in Vermont, um, they've experienced a lot of rain. Um, Vermont had nine inches of rain in one day. Um, and that was the equivalent of a hundred year storm, except the last hundred year storm was 12 years ago. And so are we talking about now these storms that are, you know, decade long instead of a hundred year long? And then uh, last, uh, over the weekend, uh, again, Philadelphia suburbs, which I'm most familiar with, um, had an, uh, an incident of flash floods from, from rain and um, people were swept away in their car. And actually this happened to be a family from, um, uh, uh, South Carolina that um, was visiting. And so it highlights, I don't know if they'd been there before, but it highlights the, the fact that people who travel and a lot of our older adults have the means to travel and are healthy enough that are, you know, retirees are going all over the place, may not know the environmental risks of areas. And especially again, with extreme weather may not know the risks. Um, this family was, was swept away, the father and the four-year-old son was able to get out and so was the grandmother, but the mother and their nine month old and four year old lost their lives. And so, um, you know, these are traumatic and awful events that are happening. So climate change is real and it is happening now and we need to be able to address the impacts of our sick earth. So what does this mean for older adults? Uh, let's first look at then the physiological changes that happen 
um, as we age. And the big one that comes up often is thermoregulation. And so as we age, our ability to uh, uh, adapt to and address um, uh, you know, physiologically the impact of heat and cold, um, we don't have the same response. And so um, you know, an older person who is um, in, in a warm setting may actually be complaining that they're cold. I did home care for many years as a visiting nurse. Um, and I remember, uh, you know, taking care of uh, people in very warm situations without air conditioning and, you know, an older lady would have her um, sweater on. And so they may not feel the cold, but their body experiences the same heat. And so they are much more susceptible to um, risks of um, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and, and uh, succumbing to heat. And as a matter of fact, heat is um, the greatest cause of mortality related to climate change. We also get um, central sensory and functional changes. So changes in our sense of smell, our sense of taste, they're not as strong. Um, our, as we age, our brain does shrink a bit. And so um, people may not respond as quickly. Um, and, and that is kind of normal age-related changes. Some of those I experienced myself. And so, um, we again, people, we may not get the same response to an emergent situation or to something that could put people at risk. <clears throat> also, as we age, um, people can, uh, with most people, experience chronic diseases and, and comorbidities. And so the leading cause of death globally uh, is cardiovascular disease, uh, cancers, diabetes, and respiratory disease. And, and these, all of these factors. Um, influence somebody's response to um, heat and or cold, and also can um, affect other factors such as cognition. And so um, they're, they're things to think about. With chronic illnesses, people are on more medications. And so I'm not going to get into each, each one of these medications, but um, just these are the, the kind of the big culprits, and there are others. And then also thinking of polypharmacy, that they may be on more than one of these medications and the combined um, effect and response, especially to heat. And so these medications are the, the culprits that cause um, people to be more susceptible to um, heat response. And um, the, the types of medications are the first ones and then the, the responses are underneath. But again, I'm not gonna get into the details of those. But what I am gonna say is one of the things um, for those who care, provide uh, direct care to older adults is to consider discussing with them how to manage um, in, in cases of extreme uh, temperatures, whether it be cold or heat. And, and so um, you wanna think about the efficacy, how effective is a medication? Um, and it, it, for most medications, there are some that need to be refrigerated, but most medications um, can be kept out at room temperature, but that needs to be between 79 and 76 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm sorry, I did not um, calculate that for um, centigrade. I'm, I apologize for that. But, um, and I'm gonna guess um, just from living in Finland briefly, I would say about 25 degrees um, centigrade, but I'm really just guessing. Um, but what uh, what the, the issue is then is the, if, if there, the medication is kept in heat for too long, it is not performing the way it's expected to. And so that can be a problem. Now I put this picture here on purpose to remind me to tell you that a fan's not gonna do the trick that um, the CDC recommends that uh, if the air temperature in the room, and so somebody in, in a heat wave um, that does not have air conditioning, the, more than likely the room is at 90 or degrees or above, they recommend that a fan doesn't work. I'm gonna say even lower than that. Um, I, would, I would say, you know, once it's 80, all you're doing is blowing around hot air. That's all you're doing with a fan. And so we need to think about for our older adult population, ways to be able to provide air conditioning um, for people. Um, and you know, we have the lie heat program in, in the US for um, people who can't afford heat. We need to consider that for people who cannot afford air conditioning because we're gonna lose a lot of lives. And yes, we need to worry about our energy sources, but we can use renewable energy sources and we have um, a, a really efficient air conditioners these days. 
Also, um, as we age, functional capacity, so our ability to ambulate or walk or get up and go from a situation um, can be a problem. And so, um, you know, again, we need to think about our older population that does need assistance, whether it be for physical mobility or cognitive abilities. Um, again, the age-related um, changes that occur, but then also as we age, we see more people with dementias and, and um, uh, you know, they may not be making the best decisions of whether to leave or not, uh, leave a bad situation, and that can be problematic. And just as a reminder, 36% of um, the older adults in the U.S. have at least one disability. So, um, you know, we're talking about a, a sizable population that we need to address their needs for. And then lastly, um, with the, the health impacts, um, and, and just as important, if not, uh, you know, more important is mental health impacts. Um, we see um, in, with people uh, stress and anxiety from weather extremes, um, from thinking about the future. Um, as I said, climate change is here. Um, you know, the best we can do right now is not make it any worse than it already is. Um, and uh, so, you know, we have uh, concerns about that in our older population, worried about their family members. Um, and then it can lead to or exacerbate existing mental health problems, such as depression, such as substance abuse. Um, this photograph is actually somebody in New Hampshire who lost their home. And so the traumatic events that are occurring because of these extreme events, which can then lead to PTSD. And then also thinking about, again, uh, moving somebody with a mental illness or with dementia to a, an um, uh, a safer situation can be problematic and it can be disorienting to people. Um, and, or, you know, uh, again, it can lead to some de delirium in some people. So there's things to think about. Um, and then we also have um, a shortage of uh, geriatric mental health providers. So uh, we've got, you know, a lot of work to do um, in this area and other areas related to climate change and health. Um, and I, I, I don't have this on the slide, but I, I want to uh, kind of call out to people who are doing this work and working with uh, populations, you also need to make sure you're taking care of yourself because um, uh, sometimes we don't do that enough and that is um, just as important. So when we do have a climate change emergency, what can happen, and, and I'm, I'm thinking Kurt's gonna get into some of this, is um, we get disruption of services. Um, and so that can be problematic again for people, you know, moving them to somewhere else, um, not being able to get a hold of their medications or um, having access to DMA, their durable medical equipment, such as um, oxygen, suction machines, whatever it is that um, is keeping them healthy and at home. Um, just uh, disruption of their support networks, whether it be family or friends or other services that they're accustomed to. And then, um, you know, we can see loss of property and loss of um, financial assets. And unfortunately, we can see loss of people too. And so, um, you know, that addressing those emergency needs are um, important. And we're seeing um, a, a pretty good job in that area with our federal government um, addressing those things and, and other organizations having uh, resources for that. So I was asked to talk also about research. So where do we go with our research? And the first thing is we need to stop studying what we already know. We don't, we don't have time for it. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that we have about six years to turn this around so it doesn't get any worse. So we need to make sure we do research that counts. Also, uh, for those of you who are doing research and publishing, and I am as well, uh, it, it takes 17 to 24 years for the public, for the, the study to be done, for it to be published and for it to change policy. And so uh, we don't have time. And I just uh, think of a, a comment from one of my heroes, Gina McCarthy, who was a previous um, EPA administrator. She said, stop studying air quality. We already know it makes us sick. So really make sure you're getting the best bang for your buck, that you're really you know, doing the work you intend to do to, to help people. But areas that I see we need to look at is climate adaptation and what works for older adults. And as I said, a lot of it's regional. So you know, the, the big data, I don't think answers the question we really need of how to address the, the issue for a particular population in a region, because we see differences across the United States of impacts. Um, there's difference in economic, social, and racial, ethnic, and ethnic groups. And so how do we address that? 
Um, also climate communication, how do we get that messaging to older adults, to policymakers? Um, I have Yale and George uh, Mason universities are doing a great job in this area and has some really good resources. Um, and so that's a great place to look, but there's much more we can do in climate communication, communicating with healthcare providers because not all of the, us are on the same page. Um, and then also looking at effective systems that can address climate change. How can we um, have seamless um, um, impact, you know, of looking at climate adaptation and climate resilience? Um, there's a lot of work being out there, but how do we bring that together? And then what is emerging in, in the research that affects the health of older adults is um, issues of food security. Um, the floods in Vermont, the farm areas, that food is gone. Um, so we can't use that. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we are going to see disruption of food. Um, nutrition, what they found in, in laboratory settings is in the presence of high CO2. Um, the micronutrients of zinc and iron are less in our plants, um, such as corn, wheat, and rice, um, and soy, and also protein is lower. And so when you think about that of, around the world, the um, people who rely on rice and, and soy, um, that can be problematic. Again, think about chronic diseases in our older population. Um, the human microbiome, which is our body's uh, bacterial environment, uh, uh, is uh, dependent on our genes and also the environment. And so if our food is different, is that going to affect our gut microbiome? Uh, is, is that going to affect our respiratory microbiome with air pollution, with breathing in um, smoke for an extended period of time? And so there are things to look at. These are opportunities for interdisciplinary work also. And then also, the um, I was at a conference um, in Oman, uh, uh, and I sat next to a veterinarian and we were talking about the one health approach um, to uh, looking at these issues. And he shared that in um, livestock, and it's also a fact for humans, when they're exposed to a lot of heat, uh, our immune system is not as strong. And so they're looking at do, do then livestock who are, affect, who are exposed to a lot of heat, um, are they um, is responsive to their vaccines or is it at risk for zoonotic diseases? And so there's the, the human piece there. And so there are things for us to look at and also think about how we can participate in that research. Uh, the last thing I will mention is that we need to take our, our science, um, we need to take it to Washington and we need to take it also, <laughs> excuse me, to our local communities. Um, many of them are doing a good job, but sometimes they need reminders. Um, our youth do know um, what's going on and, and they do have some eco-anxiety and worrying about these things. And so there's opportunities for older adults to work with the youth and take that youthful energy and the older adult wisdom and really move things forward. Um, all of you who are on this uh, call, I encourage you to continue with these sessions because they are critically important and make sure you're voting and and get our older adults, most of them don't need to be told to vote, they vote, but make sure that they're considering the impact of climate change when they vote. And then also take these stories to policymakers of, of the impact that, that you're seeing in, with the communities you're working with. And so uh, this was in the Washington Post last night that DC is gonna have some of the worst air quality. So I, that's just a hope that our policymakers then will wake up. We all breathe the same air and so maybe Maybe this will be the thing that turns the, the tide for them. Um, here are the resources and I can make my slides available. These are resources for both older adults and for those of you working in um, the specialty of uh, geriatrics. So thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, super informative. Um, I'm now gonna turn to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Pillimer. And just a reminder, we have one question, but if anybody else has other questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, and I will um, ask them at the end. All right, thank you so much. Great, thanks. And thanks for that fantastic uh, presentation. It makes one point that I do think is so critical and I'm gonna come back to it, that most of us who are doing research on aging and climate change have only been doing it for five or 10 years. There are very few of us who have, who this is all they've been doing. So one of the ideas I think in this, or one, one sort of motivational argument I would make 
is, as I think was just pointed out, this is a very vigorous, vibrant area for research where people can not only help climate change, but publish, get grants. So it's possible that people may be able to move some of their theories, models, and methods into this area. That's actually what happened to me personally. So I do think that that's great. That presentation really, uh, Ruth's presentation conveyed. I also think, you know, beyond our having this short time to make a difference, you know, how exciting this area is. I'm also thrilled to see this many um, people here. And I imagine that some of you are in that very situation that I was, I think Liat was, of having your own program of research and wondering, given the urgency of climate change is the most important problem the planet's facing, how can we adapt our work to it? So if you're sort of curious in that way, I hope we when we started you thinking about it. Um, Gina and Angie too, I wanted to say, I don't know if, um, if we have a hard stop at two or if we can continue for a little bit, just thinking about that too. Um, That's probably a question for Gina. I think we could just, logistically, we could um, potentially extend it a little bit more for Q&A, but that's, I'm not sure logistically behind the scenes if that's possible. So that's a question. Oh, we, that we could go a little over, but probably want to keep as close to two for the participants. Oh, sounds good. And I, uh, I if we, and, and if folks, we hope this is part of an ongoing dialogue. Uh, so this is a great time. So everybody is, oh, you know what I didn't do? Sorry. I continue to put that to share the sound. I am going to, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, um, if I have time, but we're doing interviews with older climate activists, so I may show you a quick video or two. Um, so I, you know, you've just heard a great presentation on why connect aging gerontology and climate change. And the only thing I will say as somebody whose air quality in Ithaca, New York is now being affected, the answer is because basically everything is about climate change or will be. And uh, Ruth and Angie, others are great examples, but in general, um, a climate change and gerontology is something of the elephant in the room. Namely, everyone is concerned about it, everyone thinks about it, many of us lie awake at night and worry about it, but it hasn't yet been widely embraced by gerontology. So, you know, either organizationally or on the part of research of this idea of bringing everything, I'm sorry, I didn't um, I shift that to slideshow. Or, or is it in slideshow mode or no? No, it's not. Very strange, why is it? Hmm. Let me, it was in slideshow mode before. Let me, it is every, can people think their own thoughts for one moment while I try to determine why that's not? But what about now? Are you seeing? Not no, yet. Now you're seeing my actual slides? No, we don't see the slides at all. I'm sorry, everyone. That's a little bit of a glitch. Hang on. If worse comes to worse, we can do it in slideshow mode, but I don't. Well, this is what we do. Okay. How about that? That's it. That looks great. Very good. Um, so, uh, you know, and for example, I will say, and present company completely excluded, an example is that we send an invitation for more information about climate change and aging to the GSA when we started the special interest group. And out of the five, out of the 5,500 members of GSA, under 40 responded. So, you know, like less than 1% of GSA members have a current enough interest in this to even want to find out more in a sense. So now that's not a criticism as much as this is an emerging area. And again, Ruth Grave, you know, gave a great 
rationale for why it's so critical. So I think uh, what we'd like to do in the special interest group and in this work is sort of move from here to here, um, but with the idea that there are strong connections. Uh, there are three major ways, I think, in which the aging population intersects with climate change. So we have these two enormous issues, the, the extensive growth in the older population and the threat of climate change, which have, as of yet, been not extensively been interconnected. One I'm not going to say anything about because it's did such a terrific job of pointing out how vulnerable folks are. The, they're also, since my parents' generation, it's clear that older people are contributing more to environmental problems. Um, they used to be more natural recyclers and reusers, older people, and they used to not travel as much and so forth. That's certainly changing. I'm not gonna deal with that more um, except to say that it's a great platform, a great area for intervention research for people who study behavior change. Uh, um, the older population is a great location in which to think about this around environmental use, et cetera. And uh, what I'm gonna talk about in the remainder of my time today is older people as active agents in mitigating and preventing and adapting to climate change. And the, uh, the concept here is that there is a need for full engagement in this of older people. Uh, the, you know, the disabilities movement has an expression, nothing about us without us. And the, the one, it's been critically important as I, Ruth, others have done to, to point out how vulnerable older people are. But, but we also risk portraying older people as passive victims. And we also need to think of them as enormous resources for, um, for environmental volunteerism and civic engagement and, um, um, and climate change action. So, so one thing, looking a little more broadly, if we have some folks on the call who are interested in, as I am, the social integration of older people, how to keep people involved in meaningful roles, responsibilities, and relationships, especially after retirement. But this is one of those rare win-win situations because older people, especially in developed countries, have both time and resources and especially after retirement, and because of their numbers, like in the US of the 75 million baby boomers could have an enormous collective impact if that can be harnessed and action can take place because of their numbers. Um, as was pointed out, involving people in climate change action and environmental civic engagement and volunteerism provides opportunities uh, to connect with younger people, and this kind of work, I wouldn't underestimate, is very appropriate for older people's life stage. And in the years since Eric Erickson, there's been a ream of research showing older people's interest in expressing generativity, especially in the 70s and beyond. And that, um, you know, the idea of leaving a world that you, that's better and that you yourself may not live to see uh, is a critical sort of developmental task that this uh, can fulfill. Um, also, we've learned that there's an environmental volunteering bonus. More research is needed, but, but it seems that even though all volunteering is, is basically good for people starting in midlife and beyond, there seem to be extra benefits of environmental volunteering. So earlier research showed that environmental volunteers are more likely to meet the physical activity recommendations and people who volunteer in other areas. Um, in a study we uh, conducted, looked at environmental volunteerism longitudinally over 20 years using a large data set and found that being an environmental volunteer conferred extra benefits in terms of meeting physical activity guidelines and health over 20 years. So it's again, it's one of those situations that's kind of good all around. Uh, there's been lots of research, we probably don't need research to tell you how important volunteer action is for environmental sustainability and conservation. So it's clear that volunteers in general help to improve local environments, change their own daily habits and practices, and thus can help others to do so, get involved in changing corporate and government policy. 
Um, and those, especially in that last area, groups now in the United States like um, Elder Climate Change Action, Third Act, uh, there's a wonderful group of thousands of older women in Switzerland who have uh, successfully petitioned to the government so you know to to engage in climate change action. So their um, uh, their collective action is critically important. Um, also, I mentioned on the previous slide is this sense of serving as voices of hope and sources of wisdom to younger people. Time doesn't allow, I think, you know, to show these videos, but, but they're they're available on the Clearinghouse website. And I think just seeing the hopeful level of older people who are committed to this work can be very beneficial to younger people. However, that would all be great, and I wouldn't need to be saying much more about it if there weren't barriers to older people's involvement. One of those um, uh, you know, results from studies we've done of local environmental organizations, and we found that many organizations aren't ready for older volunteers, don't specifically recruit them, don't adapt activities to encourage their involvement. Uh, they, uh, the one thing that we've learned, especially after retirement, is that people, but when they're deciding what to do, or want a social component to help replace what they have lost from the workplace. Often environmental activities like stream cleanups or um, trail maintenance are more solitary. And in interviewing older people and of studying them who, who are considering this kind of work, many older people that we've talked to feel that they need more specialized knowledge and they have an understanding of how to volunteer in their school or their church. Coming involved, becoming involved in this environmental movement or the climate change movement, people have described themselves as, as feeling like they kind of don't know enough even to decide the right kind of activity. Um, and that's what an intervention that we've developed, with the, the, which I'll touch on, tries to address. And then there's ageism. I hope that Leah Ayalon will give us a whole presentation on this, a whole webinar, but there certainly is a lot of ageist discourse in the environmental movement. Um, but this is from that famous uh, social scientist, Billie Eilish. Her quote was, hopefully the adults and old people start listening to us young people about climate change you know, so that we don't all die. Old people are gonna die and don't really care if we die. Um, and that has been found in the climate change movement and can maybe um, seem uninviting to some older people. So I think that what we have learned about how to promote older people's climate change action includes providing some kind of background uh, knowledge and training that people need to be most effective. That is giving them some, um, a background as they're entering into this work, um, adapting activities uh, for different level of ability. If you can't do the screen cleanup, you can help to organize it or help to fundraise for it. Uh, but we've learned that established large scale environmental organizations don't target older people as activists, and they could. Uh, um, having environmental experiences that foster a social experience as well. And a smaller point, but still an important one, even though the age related digital divide is lessening, especially when you get over 75, but we have found that you can't have all documents on a Google Drive um, and do all organization um, via the internet if, if you want to maximally involve people in that age range. Um, I want to take a couple of minutes to offer this program as an example. It's the easiest one for me to talk about because we developed it, uh, but I think it may be the only evidence-based program that exists in this space, and I'd be interested in knowing if there are others. Um, RISE, or Retirees in Service to the Environment, is a community-based program, can be um, implemented in any community. Um, and it's both a program development project, but it's also been an intervention research project, and has also let us understand issues like motivations for getting involved. And it now has a much more specific climate change focus. Um, its goal is to overcome these very barriers that I've been sharing with you. So it's for people 60 and older. There are around 15 hours of educational content. 
There's volunteer leadership training, helping people understand what they want out of volunteering and, and how to get uh, their needs met, especially if there aren't many other older people in the group. Uh, it involves a capstone project, and now it's available both in virtual and in-person versions. One of the key factors, and I'll admit it's a limiting factor because all of our experimentation with this program has shown that the live science-based educational sessions are critical. These are the typical topics, and they aren't debates or advocates. And these are taught by scientists. It might not be a professional scientist. It might be a high school environmental science teacher. But these topics are offered so that so that older so that the participants can actually engage in a dialogue about them and feel empowered about it. There is a skills for environmental action workshop I mentioned, um, and then there is a capstone project, which is typical of stewardship programs. And people have done th these kinds of projects, and now again, there's more of an emphasis specifically on climate change. Um, and we did find at the individual level. Uh, trends, at least, towards improved physical psych and psychological well-being, increased social integration, and certainly growth in environmental knowledge and in self-efficacy of feeling I can help to work with other people around environmental issues. And it involves, in each case, it's been done um, hundreds of extra volunteer hours. Um, and I can put this in the chat. We have actually some funds, so if anybody wants to do this program, we can offer them help and consultation. Um, I do want to come back to, I think, you know, to come full circle with Ruth's presentation and, uh, you know, this point of what can gerontologists do in this sphere. And again, I'll just say, I think that, you know, the urgency that was conveyed is so true, and it's really time to bring gerontology's theories, methods, measures, and techniques to bear on climate change. So folks who study decision-making in older people can look at that in terms of climate change. Certainly people doing disaster research are now starting to look at climate-related disasters. Um, and people can study environmental justice in the older population where people are in triple jeopardy it, or more, you know, if they are old, um, my, um, from an underrepresented minority and socioeconomically disadvantaged. So I think that gerontology has an enormous role, as I think we've tried to demonstrate, in understanding and intervening for climate change prevention and mitigation and adaptation. And uh, I did put the thing about the clearinghouse. I will say, since most people on this call, I think, are researchers, its most articulated page is for researchers where we have annotated bibliographies, which are useful for those of you who are just kind of curious and thinking about doing research on this topic. Uh, there's a searchable publications database. And if anyone's on this meeting whose publication we've missed, please let us know. We're always updating it. And we update um, grants and funding opportunities. And finally, anyone who's interested can be listed as a research affiliate, which helps with networking. So, I'm going to stop um, there. And, and uh, the only last thing I'll say is if, you know, please, you know, I don't know what the best way to get in touch with email us. For those of you who are in GSA who would like to be part of the, of this climate change and aging, aging group, everyone's welcome, but we're also taking names of people who aren't. Uh, and for anybody who might be interested, we're hoping to have a one day meeting on the day before GSA starts, uh, which um, expenses of the location and meals will be covered. Okay, I think that's enough plug for that. And uh, um, Angie, back to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. That was another very informative, thought-provoking uh, presentation. So we do have a question and then um, we have a, a, a handful of additional questions that we can pose um, in the interim. But our first question for both speakers comes from Sally Fowler Davis and asks, what about implementation research? For example, air quality interventions are not getting done except and unless it is for commercial innovations, i.e. air quality monitor development. What types of studies could promote participation and actually activism? 
You want to go first on that? Sure, sure. Uh, implementation research, just for people who I, I don't, is this whole group all researchers? Yes, no, then I don't have to explain what that is. Uh, I'll just go ahead. It, 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 it looks at um, the, uh, the impacts of a program. And so, yes, I think that that's a really good point. There, there are not, air quality studies are not just for um, developing a tool on, uh, uh, to measure it. Uh, there, are, um, there are tools that are already out there. One in particular is purple air, although that just measures particulates. But so there are things that are out there where um, communities or, uh, you know, or in conjunction with scholars can can do research and also adding to implementation science, I would also highly recommend um, CBPR, community based participatory research and and adding an older older adults into that mix would be really powerful, actually, you know, CBPR with older adults of what do they see as important and what what is it that they want to study. I, I, uh, I mean, I couldn't agree more, you know, we're, we're doing some other work on this really throughout gerontology, but we don't do very well with the diffusion and implementation. So if in a field I've worked in, like say caregiving, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunately very rare that even evidence-based, uh, you know, um, interventions are widely used. So I think in this one, again, because of the urgency, understanding what works and how to implement it uh, quickly is great. I think also, and I'm spinning off Ruth's presentation, there certainly is a need for diffusion of information and studying that among older people, knowing what we know about how older people, especially in the 70s and beyond, have slightly different ways of accessing uh, you know, and taking in information. I think uh, that would be great. But yeah, I think um, implementation research, like using CBPR of a very pragmatic kind, where you really are looking for results and getting those out quickly, I think are really important. I mean, we've had, you know, even with this program I described, it, like it is challenging to get uptake. People are extremely busy. It's hard to convince people to do something different. But I think that's, it's a huge fuel for implementation research and maybe the National Institute on Aging and INR other institutes can focus on speeding up implementation of programs in this area. So I, I think it's a great point. And, and if I can just add it, the other layer of that um, is public scholarship. Um, you know, if we're putting everything behind firewalls, there were only scholars can get to that information. We're not helping anybody. And and I, I'm I sit on my rank and tenure committee for my college, and and we actually have just added a piece for public scholarship. So we need to stop being, you know, kind of snobby of that peer review. It's it is critically important, but we also need to be able to share our findings to to have those impacts that we hope to have. If we're allowed to have a little dialogue, one very quick thing that I wonder if people think about. You know, I wonder if with older people, they, you know, the way you framed it, Ruth, around heat, for example, and the effects of heat and changing weather, we have a little bit of evidence that with older people in our parts of New York State, where there's much higher levels of climate change resistance, mm -hmm. that that messaging is more effective. You know, that that people seem to be more receptive to the weather and you to. Uh, you know how to protect yourself against heat and it's kind of an entree into talking about the larger issues i don't know whether you found that at all uh, i've gone to washington uh several times uh to talk to our policymakers, and most of the time i talk about air quality um you know depending on where they are but air quality is safe we all breathe the same air and it i don't ever mention climate change um, I mentioned the impacts of air and the things that cause air pollution are the things that add to our greenhouse gases. So yeah, it's a, how do we get that message? Interesting, great. So we have another question from uh, Monique Brown. If we are interested in studying climate change, how do we operationalize climate change as a variable? I was wondering, is Monique, I, I, I wonder if Mike, Ruth, unless you know exactly, I, I wondered if maybe Monique wanna, might want to ask that question and share a bit more um, 
I'm sure, yes. Um, sorry. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> yes. So, um, yes, I was just wondering um, in terms of like, for example, if we're interested in looking at climate change on the mental health of older adults, um, how would we, because I'm interested in uh, mental health outcomes. So just thinking about operationalizing climate change. I know we talked about air quality. We talked about um, heat, um, but how would we do that practically in terms of operationalizing climate change? I'll jump in and then Carl, you can. Um, so what I've seen most of the time is that they they look at, you know, the, the scholar looks at the single parameter. So whether it be extreme heat or, uh, you know, some sort of um, disaster like Hurricane Katrina. Um, and so um, I haven't seen it all put together as climate change. And that is one of the problems. And I'm looking at climate mortality um, because it's easier to count bodies uh, than it is to count uh, morbidity. And so, um, and so we don't have a single measure of that either. And so that's what actually I'm working on is to try to figure out what is that. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that is, that's a limitation for us. And it's also a limitation because again, you can hear, we got to change policy or we're not going to get anywhere. It's a limitation for when we talk to policymakers too, because if we've got all these different variables all over the place, you know, how do we put that all together? So there, there's something for you, Monique. How do, what, how do we get those climate, single climate variables, a single climate variable? Yeah, I agree. And I just say too, what you might be interested in though too, there are a lot of people, I think Leon and others would know, you know, who have looked at um, perceptions of climate change, fear about climate change, climate change anxiety and mental health. And, and those are pretty, you know, I think there's been a lot of measurement development, uh, like not just for older people. In fact, there's a whole group inside. I think there's a whole area in psychology of people now who are looking at, you know, the fears and anxiety about climate change and its outcomes. And so that might also be relevant to what you're thinking of. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So we have another question from Yin Su Shin. Thank you for the presentation. I'm conducting research on the relationship between environmental behavior and values. The older adults group can be active agents to climate change, but among the older adults, which individual is more interested in climate change? I'd like to ask you which group would be good to target to start intervention program related to climate change. Well, I'll pop in and then Ridge right down. So, so, so one, the folks we have found, well, I'm trying to think of how to put it together. When, you know, people with more resources in general have been involved in this kind of climate change activism because, you know, like, like, um, a lot of intensive volunteer work often means that you aren't still working, that you have, you know, various kinds of resources at your disposal to do it. I would say in the, when we offer these programs, it's typically people uh, um, who are college educated, uh, many of whom already have some kind of a science background, and so they're they're already literate in the research. One of our major goals is now that the program has some established evidence is to move up beyond it. Uh, but I would say that there has generally been a, you know, engagement in the programs that you can read about in the literature from higher socioeconomic status, less diverse. Uh, audiences. That's not actually the case necessarily internationally, where older people's or, um, um, associations in low and middle resource countries have been very active. So that's kind of who has been more involved. It's obviously a major gap in what we're doing in terms of engaging older people. Um, so I don't know, like that's a description of what is. I'm not sure if, if I can prescribe what to do, Ruth, what are, I mean, you know, that there are people, it's sort of like, you know, the, uh, the trans theoretical model where people start with contemplation of, of, of wanting to get involved. 
And that's often where, you know, you can find people who are sort of interested but haven't taken action yet. Uh, but, but that would be a great thing to research in and of itself. Um, what are your thoughts? I think that's a, a really valid and important point, especially in the United States, that um, yeah. all, all groups of older people are underrepresented in, in the describing the impact for themselves. So um, one of the things that we do, because we, we were fortunate enough to get an environmental justice grant, um, was you know, we gave money for people for their time um, because people were, were, you know, were leaving work um, you know, and they, you know, like you described, wealthy people can afford that, but other people can't. So we provided food and and money for the time that they spent on doing, you know, collaborating on a, a project. Um, and that, you know, isn't always, you know, not everybody has that luxury, but that's, we have to acknowledge the time that, that we're asking of our, our um, people of lower income. Excellent. And I'll just ask you a couple more minutes. I'll ask one final question to close out that I think dovetails off of that. So both of you discuss both domestic and international issues to some degree, but what does the research on climate change and aging look like from a global perspective? What does the research currently say about climate change and aging across the globe? What unique issues exist for older adults in different parts of the world? It's a big question. So you know, whatever you can provide is helpful since we do have an international audience as well. Thanks. Ruth, after you, if you. Uh, well, I, I can speak uh, generally to the, the, the general population. Um, uh, and Carl, you described this a little bit of the, in, in many parts of the world, there is greater awareness of, of climate change. Um, but, and it's mainly because they're seeing greater impact, right? I mean, you know, certainly issues of food sustainability, people migrating. Um, and so that's, you know, what I've seen, you know, in my, my travels. I was formerly the director of the Center for Global and Public Health at Villanova, so I've been to many places. Um, so, you know, I, Carl, you could probably speak to the gaps in that in international uh, scholarship. Yeah, I, I think it's so uh, there is interest in in a number of different places. For example, the organization Help Age International, for some of you probably know, has been really active in looking at climate change and climate change action in the South Asia region. Um, they started older people's associations more generally on tea plantations, other places where low income older people live. And there are certainly movements there. Look, those people realize that they were on the front line. That you know, folks in um, in the southern hemisphere are going to face regions that are essentially uninhabitable for older people, or you know, close to it. So I think uh, there is a lot of alarm. I think there are a lot of local sort of indigenous um, movements that are growing up. I'm going to take a little bit of a cop out um, and. And, and say that this was a great area for more knowledge. And it's one reason for the interest group and for trying to, trying to connect people internationally. One is that there's probably a lot of climate change action involving older people going on that we're not aware of. And we've listed all the organizations that we could find on the Climate Change Clearinghouse website. But I'm sure there are more best practices, programs that, that engage older people, so really doing an inventory, understanding where that's going on internationally, I think that would be great. And certainly there have only been a few international studies of even attitudes and receptiveness towards climate change information. So that's another really big area of research. Using international surveys, what are older people thinking about this issue? How prepared are they? What are, you know, so I think that it's so new thinking about it this way that I think it's just a huge area for future research that I hope people really pick up on. Uh, um, the World Health Organization is starting to become interested in it. So there's a group there, there's a small UN group. So I think you know, creating international dialogue on this is really gonna help everybody. Excellent. 
Well, this has been a really generative uh, session. We'll have additional webinars. Um, this is a webinar series. So we'll have another one in mid-September that will focus on emerging policy and practice issues uh, regarding climate change and aging. Um, we're planning one in early December that will focus on climate change impact on the healthcare for older adults, healthcare systems in particular. And then in February, um, relating to global policy on aging and climate change. So we are so thrilled to have both of you as our inaugural speakers for this webinar series. And we do hope that all of you um, and more will continue to participate in the webinar series. Gina um, included a link on how to get involved in the interest group. And uh, Carl also provided his email um, in the uh, chat. So please reach out and thank you so much for your participation. And we look forward to seeing all of you very soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andy. Bye.